I'm, I'm interested in the brain, uh, but I've been doing that for about five years. Before that, I was doing image processing. And the thing, I, I think the link between the two is that uh, a huge part of your brain, especially since you're a primate, this is typical of primates, a big, big part of your brain is used for processing your visual input. So uh, some experts say half of your brain is involved in vision somehow. So let me just share with you a couple um, sort of approaches or a couple of things that I think are interesting about image processing. So I call this talk uh, Fun with Fractals and Frequencies. So first of all, before I get started, you need to know what an image is in terms of uh, computers and computer science. So you've, seen, you've all seen thousands of images by now. So here's an image. But um, an image is made up of pixels. So if you zoom in on an image, you'll see it's actually a whole bunch of little tiny squares. And each square has associated with it a number. This one's a gray scale image. So every pixel has just an intensity. Basically, the bigger the number, the brighter it is. So I can zoom in on it. Uh, I won't be able to show you that as I hover over. Each, each uh, pixel shows you a different number, but that doesn't matter. I think, you can, I think you probably understand this already. It's a big table of numbers. And each image is a big table of numbers. If it's a color image, you basically have uh, each pixel has three numbers, red, green, and blue. And uh, so once you have a big table of numbers, you can start throwing at it all sorts of different mathematical techniques. Right? Basically, everything you've learned, you can throw at it. You can, you can add numbers to it. You can subtract. You can multiply and divide. You can move them around. You can flip them over, anything. So that's basically image processing, applying mathematics uh, using computers to images. <clears throat> OK, so let's talk first about frequencies. Now, I've got a number of uh, audio demonstrations as well. So this is a Python script. Now, when I'm going to talk about frequencies, you need to know what a frequency is. And it's basically like a sine curve or a cosine curve. Many of you will probably know what those are. But in case you don't, here's what uh, a sine curve looks like. Let me simplify that. So a, a pure tone, that's just like a sine curve, OK, or a cos curve in this case. Now, what I've got down here is uh, it's basically I took that signal apart, and I'm showing you how much of each frequency is present in that image or in that signal. So you can see this is pretty much a, a pretty low frequency sine wave. And so that, uh, that single frequency there has a big component. And all the other frequencies have zero, a weight zero. So if I add some other frequencies in there, you can see now I've got two different frequencies in here. And you can see the, the signal is a combination of two frequencies. And I can add in more and more frequencies and create more and more complex um, signals. Basically, the further to the right you get, the higher the frequency, the faster the oscillations will be. So believe it or not, you can represent any signal, any signal you want, even the sound that I'm speaking right now, you can represent it as a combination of different frequencies, and you just scale up or scale down the amount of each frequency that's in that signal. In fact, you may not know it, but your brain, your auditory system, is actually undoing that, or is basically taking the time series signal that of my voice and is converting it all to frequencies in your brain, in your ear. Your, your, your auditory system does a frequency decomposition, which is why it's easy for us to detect uh, a multiple of two in tone. So I'm going to try to sing. Mm, mm, right? That's multiplying by two. I multiplied the frequency by two, and you immediately recognize that as an octave change, right? Hey, your, your auditory system is doing multiplication. And it's because you're doing a frequency decomposition that you can, that you can pick that up. So instead of me singing, let's uh, let the computer sing. So this is actually a signal of a simple tone. It doesn't look like much, because what you're looking at is the time domain. right? It's basically an oscillation. It's going so quickly, it just looks like a big blue box. But the frequency decomposition looks like this. It looks like basically a single tone. This is a zero frequency in the middle. And if you move to the right a little bit, you'll see all the, well, all the Fourier coefficients are zero, so all the frequencies are not present, except this one frequency 
has a lot of energy in it. And then it's just reflected across the negative side too. But it's really just one tone. So let's see what this sounds like. So I'd like to play for you. Okay. So this is really loud. So that's basically two frequencies put together. Let me add another frequency. So what I'm doing is I'm just changing the Fourier coefficients. If you were to look at the, the time signal, it looks like that. But if you were to look at the frequency decomposition, it looks much cleaner. That's what the frequency decomposition looks like. It's just three tones put together. I think it's uh, a chord. Okay, so you can decompose sound into its multiple um, frequency components, and you can start playing with it, and you can uh, do some interesting things. So Fourier transform basically allows you to decompose it into a bunch of signals. So what I'm doing now here is, is including higher and higher frequency components. And as it does, you can see the blue signal on the top is going to get closer and closer to the, the gray signal. Okay? It's, it's including higher and higher frequency components. And the, the yellow curve there shows how much of each component is included in that signal. So the, we call it the Fourier transform is the, uh, it's the algorithm or the mathematical construct that takes a signal and spits out for you how much of each frequency is involved in that signal. So you can do the same thing not just to acoustic waves, but also to um, space, so images. What I'm showing you here is a two-dimensional Fourier transform. So this is the origin right in the middle here. And you can see there's a little dot here just near the center. That's showing one Fourier coefficient that's not zero. Okay, so the origin's here. This one's up here to the right a little bit. And that if the, the function that, or the Fourier function that corresponds to that one dot, that one Fourier coefficient, is this wavefront here. And you can see that it's oriented at the same angle as this thing from the origin. The origin's there, so you can see it's kind of up at sort of like a, I don't know, an 80 degree angle or something. And that's the orientation of these here. So you can start putting them together, a whole bunch of these components. So now this is two put together. If I were to zoom in here again, I've got two non-zero Fourier coefficients. And if I put those two waves together, I get that pattern. And so you can build up images by putting together multiple frequency components. So in this case, I've got four little non-zero Fourier coefficients. Each one corresponds to a sine wave of, or a cos wave of a, of a particular frequency. Put them together, I get this chessboard thing. Okay, that's a very simplistic version of reconstructing an image from its frequency components. But you could take any image, deconstruct it into a whole bunch of different sine uh, wave fronts, sine and cosine wave fronts, and those are your frequency components of your image. If you go to the uh, Wikipedia webpage for Fourier transform, it shows you this thing. This is some signal F. You can see it looks like the boxcar thing I had. And if you do the Fourier transform, you find out these are all those, all those blue curves are the different trig curves, trigonometric curves that are involved in approximating that function. If you separate them out, you can look at how much of each one is in there. So this is just a different way to visualize a frequency decomposition. It's a very natural thing for people to do. Turns out it's uh, very helpful for us. All right, so let's play with frequencies. Um, you heard a, a song before. So what I want to do is play, show you what it sounds like, what different frequencies sound like. So first of all, here is the original clip of music. So this is actually the second demonstration, but uh, it demonstrates some of the same stuff. So you've probably heard that song before. What I want you to listen for, there's a, like the tick, 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 tick. That's the part I'm not interested in. It's the person singing in the background. What we're hearing is uh, frequency modulation. It starts out only the low frequencies, very muffled. And as time goes on, it gets more and more full because it's starting, they're starting to include higher and higher frequencies. So um, musicians and uh, um, whatever the name of the uh, audio technicians, I guess. They do a lot of this sort of stuff, playing with frequencies. So I'll start it over again. So listen to the singing in the background, and see, notice how it goes from muffled into a full-fledged uh, high fidelity sound. So you can hear it better.
So that's a, a frequency modulation. And they're taking only the voice track and they're applying this, uh, this time filter to it. I can show you uh, the same thing going the opposite direction, starting with higher frequencies, starting with all of the frequencies, and over time, getting rid of the high frequencies, and you get, you get only lower and lower frequencies. It starts to sound more and more muffled. Okay, so in this case, it's the banjo in the, in, that you're, that's going, be, that's being filtered. So you probably heard that at the beginning. You could hear it really nicely, but as time went on, it got more and more muffled. It's because they're basically removing more and more high frequencies from that part of the signal, and you're getting only the low frequencies. So you can actually use a Fourier transform to separate these things apart. So I can filter out and give you only the low parts. So I cut out all the high frequencies. And hopefully this will play it for me. You can just hear a little echo of someone's voice in the background. So now if I get rid of only get rid of the low frequencies and play the high frequencies for you, you can hear the part that was missing. So I'm showing here the Fourier transform. I've just played for you the red, the sound corresponding to those red Fourier coefficients, the low frequencies. Now I'll play for you the, the part of the sound corresponding to the blue. So you can hear that it's very tinny. So this is the both parts put together. So using the frequency decomposition, I could separate out so the piano part and the voice part. So it's something that image processing allows you to do, or uh, signal processing allows you to do. So if we apply these same sorts of ideas to images, Let's bring back our frog here. What I'm showing here on the left is a picture of the frog. On the right is the, the two-dimensional Fourier transform. You can see in the middle, there are a lot of high-intensity Fourier coefficients. In fact, most things that you look at in your life, including images on the internet, are mostly composed of low-frequency information. And there's, there's a lot of high-frequency high information, but it's lower intensity. So we can play with that stuff. I'm going to... Um, apply this filter to the Fourier coefficient. So only the stuff in the middle is going to be left. Everything else is going to be set to zero. So just like we had the muffled sound, it sounded like someone put a pillow over, their, over, the, over the person singing, we're going to muffle the visual information and include only the low frequency information. So there, I've applied the filter to the, this is the, these are the Fourier coefficients, all zero at the high frequencies, but the low frequencies are still intact. And what does that image look like? It's like this. So I think you can see that's like blurry version of the image. If you blur an image, you're basically getting rid of a lot of the high frequency information and keeping the low frequency information. The opposite of that is uh, keeping the high frequencies. So this is the opposite. I've set the low frequencies to zero, and then keeping the high frequencies, let's see what that image looks like. Okay, it looks like just all the edges. You get rid of all the basic intensity information, bright here, dark here. You lose that stuff, but you keep the edges. Okay, so let's try it on something interesting. Now, you would have seen on your, uh, on your handout this figure here. So this is a, a famous optical illusion. And when I was doing image processing, had all this, I had all this knowledge of, uh, of frequencies and images, and, or frequencies and images. And I saw this. So the way this works is if you walk up close to the optical illusion, you see one face is neutral, one face is angry. And then when you walk away, further away, you see something different. So let me. Let me simulate you walking far away. If I make this really small, it's like you've walked far away. And the left hand image looks neutral, the right hand looks angry. Okay? Now if we go up closer, they switch. Now the left is angry and the right is neutral. 
Now, why does that work? What is it about your visual system or the computer or something that makes that work? So it turns out your visual system filters the world. Okay, you can't take in infinite spatial frequencies into your eyeballs. Your eyeballs will only actually encode a certain range of frequencies. If you're looking at a frequency out in the world, so this little band up here shows the frequencies, like a bunch of oscillations here. If you were to walk closer to that, it starts to, the same spatial frequency actually starts to look like a lower frequency. So just the distance you are from an object dictates what frequencies you observe in that object. So by getting closer and further from the, uh, from the pictures of the faces, you're changing what frequency component in the image your visual system is sensitive to and picking up. To prove that to you, I'm going to do a frequency decomposition of these and separate out the high and low frequency components. And you'll see that the two different emotions are stuck in the different components. So first of all, here are the low frequency components in the image. So according to the low frequency components, the, stuff, the, the person on the left looks neutral and the right looks angry. So this is what you would see if you were far away. If you came up close, you would see more of the high frequencies. And so this is what the high frequency components of those two faces look like. You can see it's swapped now. The one on the left looks angry. According to the high frequencies in the image, you see an angry person on the left and neutral on the right. Okay, so both of these pictures on the left came from the same image, but they were superimposed on top of each other. And which, which part your visual system sees depends on how far you are from the image because of your inherent uh, frequencies that your visual system can observe. So I can actually swap them and, and I can put together, I can sort of reunite the two neutral pieces and the two angry pieces into this. So this now should be both the high and the low frequencies are showing the same emotion. So if we go up really close, it looks angry on the left, neutral on the right. If we go far away, it still looks angry on the left and neutral on the right. Okay, because uh, I swapped their, their uh, frequency components. So I think that's just an interesting demonstration that your visual system is doing filtering on your visual world all the time. So the point of that, this part of the talk is that uh, frequency decompositions decompositions are a really useful way to uh, process images and, and understand how the world works and how things are encoded. Now let me switch gears. Oh yeah, so there's one more thing here. Uh, here's another demonstration of how, how close you are changes what you see. When you're this far away from this image, you see a clown. I'm sorry if anyone here is afraid of clowns because it's going to get real in a second. But if you zoom in really close, you see this is actually a photo mosaic of a bunch of smaller images. And when you zoom in close, you can actually see the individual uh, tiles that make up the bigger image. This is some work that uh, a pro graphics professor and I published a few years ago. OK. Fun with frequencies. That's the frequency part. Now, I, I really love this fractal part. It's something so simple but so cool. So I want to show you how to produce these fractals. What you're seeing on the left there is a fractal. A fractal is basically a shape that's produced using mathematics that has uh, some properties called, or a property called self-similarity. So let me describe to you what self-similarity is. So what we're looking at here is uh, I'll generate a Cantor set. Put up your hand if you've seen a Cantor set or know what a Cantor set is. Just the camera person. <laughs> Good for you. OK, so let me describe. It's very simple. Here's a line that goes from, let's say, 0 to 1. Now I'm going to cut out the middle third, OK? That's all. That basically will teach you now how to make a Cantor set, because that same process you apply to each of the pieces that remain, right? I've got a piece here on the left. I'm going to, apply, I'm going to remove the middle third of that. Same on the right. I'm going to remove a middle third. OK, now I have four little line segments. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to remove the middle third of each of those line segments. There are eight, sorry, there are four of them now. Now there are eight, I'm going to do the same thing to those, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can imagine that as, as you go to infinity, you get this, this set of points that have like an infinite number of little holes in them. Okay, it's, a, it's got some strange properties as far as sets go. It's an interesting thing to study in mathematics. Um, so it's called the Cantor set. And you can 
you can produce this, or, or I guess one of the interesting properties of a Cantor set is that it's self-similar. So if you look at the whole Cantor set, it's actually an exact replica of these smaller parts. So if you take the whole Cantor set, shrink it down to one-third size, and put it on the left there, that's what you get. Same thing on the right. So the Cantor set can be created by taking the whole, the whole, the whole line, shrinking it down to one-third, and placing it in those two different spots. But you do it again, right? Don't stop there. Now take those two pieces. Now they, they form some line, right? You take those two pieces and you shrink them down, okay? So that's the idea um, of self-similarity. How a small piece of your set is the same as the big piece of the whole set. So here's another famous example. It's called the Sierpinski gasket or triangle. So you've got one on your piece of paper. I want you to find the self-similarity. What smaller piece is an exact replica of the whole image? So I, the question I asked was, which triangle or, or what part of the image is, is a smaller copy of the whole image? Turns out there is no wrong answer because every part of it is a copy of the whole image. So you've got this big triangle here. The next level down, you can see there's this, there's this sort of half-sized triangle up here. It is an exact replica of the big one. Same with this one down here. So far, you, know, you can put it on top there and you can see they match exactly. Not only that, but you know, this triangle here is an exact replica of the big one. It's just a smaller version. And this triangle here is a smaller version. And so on and so on. Every triangle is an exact replica of the big triangle. So how do we make these? So first of all, you observe which or where the self-similarity is. In fact, you only have to observe kind of one level of self-similarity. One scale down, and you use that over and over again. So this can be decomposed into three main parts. You can scale the main triangle down into that, that, and that. So those, those three mappings of the set. That describes the set. Even though the set has infinite detail, that describes the set in, in full. And so we'll call them mapping one, mapping two, mapping three. OK, so let me demonstrate how we make these. So I'm starting with one dot. Here is my current set. It's just this big square. I'm going to apply those three mappings. OK, so you can see my new image is just three copies of my other image. OK, now I'm going to do it again. So now my, my image has three dots in it. So now I'm going to dupl or triplicate that three times, right? There's a copy of it up here, here, and here. You just keep doing that process over and over again. And it converges on the Sierpinski gasket. And what's even cooler is it doesn't even matter what your initial image is. Let me start with uh, something different. So this is a different image. Okay, I create three copies of it. Create a new image, I create three copies of that image. Yes, 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 and it converges on the Sierpinski gasket again. It doesn't matter what your initial image is. You like that, eh? Yeah. Okay. Now this is self-similar as well. Find, you have this on your piece of paper, there are four mappings here. Where the, where the smaller parts of the, of the shape are actually smaller versions of the whole image. One is not very interesting. Three of them you should be able to see. Right, that whole lower leaf there, the leaf on the lower right, is a copy of the whole big thing. And you can see this one on, lo on the lower left is also a copy. And to prove that to you, so there's one of the four mappings. Right, that lower leaf is one of the mappings. This one on the lower right is also, I don't have a little animation to show you that one. But uh, there's another one, that, the one the, another one that's more subtle. So we've got this one here, we've got this one here. What other one? Yeah? The stem, the stem? yeah, that's right. That's the uninteresting one. It's, most people wouldn't get that, but yeah, it's the stem. So you just like smush it down. What's the other, what's the fourth mapping?
Okay, let me demonstrate it to you. There's the whole image. If I shrink it a bit and move it up and tilt it ever so slightly, there's another version. So it's self-similar in that way too. So there are these four mappings. One, two, three, four. There's this the little stem ones, kind of just smushes it down. So those, using those four mappings, it perfectly describes what we call the spleenwort fern. So here's the algorithm to generate these. You start with some image. It doesn't matter what image, like the yes or the little dot or whatever. And then you iterate through this thing. Each iteration, you create a blank image. And then you start populating that blank image with smaller versions of your image f. Whether it's the yes image or whatever, that image you're, you're updating as you go along. But you just basically apply your mapping f, each mapping f, and add it to g. So that's what I showed you. So let's do it with the fern. So we'll start with the yes again, doesn't matter. So there should be, I hit go and there should be four copies, right? One is down here for the leaf, one's down here for the other leaf. There's the stem and this other one's just shoved up and rotated and shrunken down a little bit. Doesn't look like much yet, but if I keep going, so every time, oh, that's a satisfying sound. Every time I press the button, it's taking its latest and greatest version and mapping it again. And it converges on this fern shape. So it's kind of cool. I like this, uh, this self-similarity, sort of infinite recursion. By the way, in first year, we teach uh, the programming we teach if you put up your hand if you know what recursion is. A lot of you do. When I first heard about recursion, it was like, no way. <laughs> this works? So in first year here, we teach recursion to the hilt. It's all recursion, so it's really cool. Um, what do you think this will do? I've got here this big square, and what you're seeing is each blue square is a mapping. So there are about, I don't know, 20 different mappings here. What do you think that fractal is going to look like? So actually, you, you, see, you see it on your thing, right? Well, you see something like it on your thing. So let me run that one. That's the no iterative function system. So just to be ornery, we'll start with a yes. But you can see it maps that yes a whole bunch of times into those, square, those rectangles that suggest the word no. If I keep going, what I end up with is a fractal version of the word no made up entirely of, of fractal versions of the word no. And it's self-similar. If I were to keep going, it's self-similar at every scale. And I can do the same thing with yes, but the really cool thing, uh, which I think you have on your sheet, is what happens if I do this back and forth iteration. So I can generate a fractal now, not just taking this and mapping it into each of these small ones. I could also do a yes, where I take the whole thing, mapping it into each of these small squares. Instead, I'm going to alternate back and forth. So I'm going to take this whole image here, and I'm going to map it into each of these. So I'm only going to build my yes out of no's, and I'm going to build my no's out of yeses. And that's where I get these fractals from. This no is made out of yes, and the yes is made out of no's. But if you look at inside the no, you see a bunch of yeses, right? But inside the yes, it's all made of no's, and inside the no's, it's all made of yeses. I just thought that was really neat. <laughs> So when a student comes to my office asking a yes or no question, I just point them there. So I've told you about uh, frequencies and how you can decompose audio signals and images into their component frequencies and, and play with them. I've also showed you how to make uh, these iterated function system fractals, a very simple algorithm. And uh, that's this, those are what I think are some really cool things about image processing. Thanks for your attention.